Welcome to episode 35 of Counseling Corner, where I try to give practical application to biblical truth. As always, I am your host, Isaac Johnson. And uh, well, we finally got snow here in Alaska. Uh, It took a little bit longer than normal, and again, no one was complaining. But on November 5th, this last Sunday, we got over six inches, which was a record for Alaska on that day in history. Um, so a little more than we expected. And I, I do feel bad. I feel like I'm kind of responsible for the fact that we got snow because I remember saying a while back, uh, I was getting so sick of the rain that I just said, man, I, I think I would rather have snow than rain. And clearly God was paying attention. So I, I apologize to all of my fellow Alaskans there. So when it comes to conflict, uh, you know, I would suspect that the majority of us do not enjoy it. We, we generally seek to avoid it if possible, and a lot of us believe that a relationship is healthier when it has no conflict or at least less conflict. But what's interesting is that the Bible does not share these negative perceptions about conflict, and really neither does science. You know, we see God time after time not only use conflict to his advantage, but even instigate it and perpetuate it in order to accomplish his will. You know, when Satan rebelled against God in heaven, you know, God could have just snapped his fingers and destroyed Satan. Problem solved, right? But instead, he banished Satan from heaven and even allowed Satan to take a third of the angels with him. And we have been caught up in this cosmic battle ever since. And probably one of the more famous examples of God using conflict is when he picks a fight with Pharaoh in the first 14 chapters of Exodus. You know, Egypt has enslaved God's people for over 400 years, and God has had enough. Now, of course, God could have just easily freed the Israelites without involving Pharaoh at all, but he took the opportunity to show off his power to the world. You know, and then once God establishes Israel as a nation, he makes them a stench in the nostrils of their enemies, 1 Samuel 13, 14, by goading the Philistines and other enemies of Israel to attack them so that Israel could rout them over and over again. (laughs) It doesn't sound very passive to me. We also see many examples of God verbally initiating conflict in his interactions with mankind. You know, there's the heated conversation God has with Job in Job chapter 38, or the many tense exchanges God engages in with Moses on Mount Sinai. And How about, you know, the the, the things he does, you know, the conversations he has with Balaam and Jonah, uh, other prophets that he had as well. And, And let's not forget Jesus. I mean, the son of God who was constantly in conflict with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and even his own disciples. Jesus even said in Matthew 10, 34, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And since science always catches up with the Bible, studies have revealed that healthy relationships are not void of conflict, you know, like many of us would like to believe, but in fact, they actually require it. You know, so if God, you know, seems to be in favor of conflict and and science appears to concur, my next question is why? You know, how can something that feels so emotionally and physically unpleasant actually benefit us? Well, first of all, Conflict just has a way of bringing hidden issues to the surface. You know, so Bill and Sandy, they've been married for eight years, and lately they have been arguing more, especially about their finances. You know, Sandy is angry with Bill because he recently made several large purchases without consulting her first. You know, Bill doesn't understand why Sandy is so upset. He makes a good living. They have plenty of money in the bank. And besides, everything he bought were items they actually needed. You know, Bill is finding himself getting more defensive with Sandy because he feels she doesn't trust him. He also is kind of indignant with Sandy because he thinks she is being controlling and selfish. I mean, he's been a good provider and rarely asks anything from her. And at first glance, this just looks like a common marital spat over money. But when we take a closer look, we see deeper issues of trust, pride, insecurity, fear, childhood trauma and and neglect. You know, Sandy was raised in a home where children were seen and not heard. She often felt ignored and unimportant, especially by her dad. Bill's family dynamics were the opposite. He was the only child and his parents were 
overprotective, controlling, and seem to value academic and financial success over everything else. So when Bill and Sandy, you know, when they fight about money, which is kind of the surface issue, these deeper subconscious wounds from their childhood, they, they get triggered. And when Bill does not include his wife in a financial decision, she feels ignored and neglected, just like she did as a child. But she lashes out at Bill in ways she did not feel permission to do with her parents. And when she does this, well, Bill feels controlled, like he did when his parents would make choices for him. So this motivates him to feel justified to rebel from Sandy in a way he could never do growing up. So, you know, it takes a few rounds of conflict, but eventually the Holy Spirit is able to use their disagreements over money to reveal to Bill and Sandy their unhealed wounds from their childhood that they both thought they had put behind them. Now, conflict didn't fix their issues. That took some prayer and and some counseling. But without these uncomfortable disputes, their unidentified wounds could have continued to hold them hostage. God used conflict with the Israelites to expose their hidden pride and stubbornness. Jesus incited conflict with the teachers of the law to bring to light their jealousy and lack of faith. God uses conflict in our marriages, our families, our jobs, and even in the church to bring our unconfessed sin out in the open so we can get healing. He uses conflict to force unresolved trauma to the surface so we can no longer live in denial or be held captive by shame. So, revelation through conflict, it's rarely pleasant, but man, it can be oh so liberating. You know, secondly, conflict, well, you know, it just forces connection. So, you know, you got disputes, squabbles, you know, just flat out disagreements. They are often what motivate us to move towards someone that we might otherwise avoid. In fact, Dr. John Gottman has found that quality relationships, they seem to possess what he calls kind of a healthy simmering tension that keeps drawing people back to each other over and over again. You know, when you think about it, the people we tend to value the most in our lives are often the ones we've had the most conflict with. Yeah, I can't think of anyone I have argued with more than my wife, but I can say with all honesty and sincerity that she is my best friend on this earth. And the reason I have so much respect for authority figures in my life today is because all of the healthy battles I was able to have with them growing up. Conflict, it forces us to interact with uncomfortable people in our lives (laughs) that we know we need to have relationship with, but would probably much rather avoid if we were allowed to. Some of the best sports teams in history were forged and united through conflict. Uh, I love the movie, Remember the Titans. It's a great example of this, where the team, you know, they had to win their battle with race in the locker room before they could win the battle on the field. Their shared turmoil brought them together better than any motivational speech ever could. And, you know, some of our most intimate friendships are born out of traumatic discord and strife, such as combat, a crisis, a shared cause any other challenging experience that we are forced to endure with an individual or a group. It draws us together. You see, in the Bible, where where David's friendship with Jonathan was strengthened in the midst of David's conflict with Jonathan's father, King Saul. You know, Saul wanted to kill David, and and that that frustration and all that, that, you know, discord actually drew Jonathan and David. It forced them to become even closer during that difficult time. Jesus' relationship with his disciples would have never been as tight without the three years of shared adversity that they all had. You know. And God, he's always used the conflict of persecution to grow his church. You know, We see the, the day of Pentecost where persecution caused 3,000 people to come to church at one time. I have never been to one of those kind of services. That would be awesome. You know, God also uses conflict to draw us closer to him. God wants us to ask him why, to wrestle with him and to get frustrated with him because more often than not, our irritation moves us towards meditation. In other words, if we're agitated with God, we are thinking about God. I remember when I was in college, I realized uh, uh, kind of the moment where I thought I wanted to be a counselor was when I would have a lot of my um, friends about my age would come to me and they were complaining because their girlfriends were mad at them. And I remember just saying, well, good. 
If they're angry at you, they're still thinking about you. Now, if they're apathetic, it's over. You know, so God does that too, where he creates conflict with us sometimes, and or he's certainly willing to allow us to feel uh, that agitation with us because it keeps us coming back to him and keeps us asking questions and wrestling with him. And it, hap- it works the same way with people. You know, so conflict doesn't have to create connection. It doesn't always, because unfortunately, many of us do use it as an excuse to justify avoiding relationship. But if we embrace conflict and allow it to bring us together as God designed, it really has the power to produce unbreakable bonds. And then lastly, conflict just minimizes the big one. So I live in Alaska and up here, you know, way up north, as they say, you know, it's pretty common to have earthquakes. You know, it's not unusual for us to have a 5.0 or even a 6.0 magnitude shaker every few months. And while they are a little nerving, definitely maybe sometimes a little more than unnerving, what really makes us Alaskan, uh, an Alaskan nervous is when we haven't felt an earthquake in maybe five or six months or more. Because this is, this is kind of because the longer we go without a small to medium manageable quake, the more likely it becomes that we will experience a potentially catastrophic earthquake. The longer the pressure in the Earth's crust builds, the greater the magnitude tends to be when the plates finally shift. And relationships, they kind of operate in a similar manner. When hurt feelings, issues, insecurities, and trauma go undealt with, instead of just harmlessly dissipating, they build in intensity until the pressure is too great to contain and a verbal 9.0 disruption occurs. However, when we initiate and embrace small, manageable conflicts in relationships, like letting someone know right away when they have unintentionally hurt our feelings, or, or sharing our honest opinions and concerns respectfully when they come to our attention, we release emotional pressure intentionally and constructively, thus decreasing the chances of a calamitous disruption. You know, that may just be irreparable. For example, we'd all rather have our spouse tell us they're thinking about having an affair than to have them confess to us that they are currently engaged in one or have had one. Now, both conversations would be painful. But the first one, when they just tell us that they're thinking about it, that feels hopeful. While the second one, where they've confessed that they've had an affair, that can feel hopeless. So, you know, that, but, but just having that conversation, you know, being willing to, 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 you know, share those, what we're thinking about doing rather than what we've did, that allows uh, uh, those little, you know, that pressure to release. We can talk through things and then hopefully we can avoid uh, the bigger, um, you know, disaster. And God, you know, he designed relationships to be able to handle really well daily controllable conflicts based on honesty and vulnerability. You know, healthy conflict is the emotional fiber our relationships require to keep things running smoothly and prevent the pressure and pain we experience when things get too backed up. Now, there's an image you're not going to be able to get out of your mind. You know, so doing conflict well, you know, that takes years of practice, patience, and persistence. You know, God has never shied away from conflict, and he does not want us to either. You know, conflict, it can either be a constructive a uh, relational tool we use to bring revelation, connection, and release pressure, or it can be an excuse to stay trapped in denial, fear, and isolation. You know? And so, uh, the choice, uh, well, that's going to be up to us. So, thank you, as always, for listening today. And, um, you know, just if you ever want to reach out to me, give me any kind of feedback about this episode or any other episodes or any topics that you would like me to, you know, talk about in the future, uh, just please email me at yakimamft at gmail.com. That's Y-A-K-I-M-A-M-F-T at gmail.com. And um, just ask that you would just share this, you know, give it a review, just get the word out so we can just help more people. And uh, as always, uh, until we meet again, I just pray that you have a restful, an impactful week.